Model deployment, here we go. So this material was totally copied and then minorly adapted from this tutorial linked here by my colleague, Tom. So you can also check out the original later if you're interested. And so what is deployment? Um, and I'll just say, I'm happy to actually get this in here because last time I thought, of course, I really wanted to teach this, but I just ran out of time. So here's the thing, we've kept talking about how to make a machine learning model or pipeline, but how do we use it? We, we probably are not going to use it by sending it to our customer with our whole Python thing and them to install everything and train and whatever. Like that's, that's not really gonna work. So what we'd like to do is make the model conveniently accessible. So we're gonna save the model as a file, the trained model. Um, and then we're going to try to make it accessible for people to use without them needing our Python stack, without them needing access to our data, um, any of that kind of stuff. So we're going to use some tools. Uh, Joblib is a Python package and Flask and uh, Heroku are some other tools we're going to use. So um, Tom's original thing was like a tutorial that you follow along. And now what's left here is like a sort of a tutorial but I'm not gonna go through all the steps because it would take too long. So you can, if you want more detail and you wanna really do it yourself, I would recommend Tom's tutorial. But some of these things, I just already did this. I already installed some extra stuff um, and you can do that too if you want. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare a model. So uh, just following Tom's tutorial, I'm gonna build a regression model on, and I should have thought, that how to pronounce this since I knew I was going to teach. Is this, is it abalone? Is that how you say it? Or is it abalone? Okay. <laughs> um, I'll just, oh, it's abalone? Uh, no one knows. Okay, I'm going to say abalone, but I have no idea. Some sort of sea creature as far as I know. Um, anyways, we're going to try to predict the age of some sea creature. Um, and so th this is just one of these classic data sets that's linked to here. And that we're just gonna make, we're gonna make a, like a toy model, uh, excessively simple just for demonstration purposes. So we'll load up this data. Wikipedia says it's the former, I don't even remember which was the former anymore. Anyways, um, so I have some features ab about the size of this creature and um, I'm going to try to predict how old it was based on the number of rings it has. I really don't know anything about these. Um, but here's what the data looks like. I have some length, diameter, height, and weight, and I'm going to try to predict the number of rings, which is related to the age. Um, okay, so I'm going to use a random forest regressor for this. This is a regression problem. As you can see, the y values are numeric. And so I'm going to just build this toy random forest model. It's not even a good model, but it doesn't matter. We're just demonstrating. Um, so here, here's one thing that we've never done before, um, this. So what we can do when we're ready to deploy the model, after we're done everything we talked about in this course, you may want to retrain on the full data set, meaning X that contains train and test, which is something we've never done before in this course. And like the argument for doing this is, well, I'm done. So when I'm about to use this, shouldn't I just have as much data as possible? And so I'm just going to train on everything, train and test. Um, the cons for that, so that's, it, it might be a better model because you've trained on more data and more data is always good, but it's kind of scary because you can't actually test it because you have no unseen data. So, um, I actually still need to investigate more and ask around like what are people doing most commonly, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are retraining on the whole data set, despite the fact that it's a little bit scary. That's kind of my feeling about what people are doing. So anyways, I'm going to do that here. So I'm going to retrain on the whole data set, um, train and test. I can't, I can't test this out because I've trained on everything, but it should be a slightly better model than the one that's only trained on part of my data. And now I'm going to save this trained model using this Python package joblib. And we don't really need to go into details, but it has this dump function. I'm just dumping the model object, which is a scikit-learn random forest regressor into this file f 
that I just gave it a name. And so now there'll be a file on my computer um, that is this trained model and I can load it up later and use it, which is gonna be useful. Uh, couldn't we leave a very small portion of the data to test one last time? Yeah, but then um, like the test, like if you only leave like five examples, then that test score is gonna be super sketch because um, it's so small, so it's pretty hard. Any questions about anything so far? Okay, so I'm just gonna show you this function called return prediction. It's not that critical for us to look at it, but um, this function takes in the model and the input, which is basically gonna be in the form of a dictionary and it turns the dictionary into a list and then calls predict. So it's not really that important. It's basically just turning a dictionary into a list. And so if I call this, I can pass in a dictionary with the four features and it's gonna give me the prediction by calling predict. So scikit-learn predict takes in a list or an array as we know, uh, but we're gonna be sending in the data in the form of a dictionary as you'll see in a minute. Uh, is JobLib doing anything other than simple object serialization? I actually don't know. Uh, you'll have to check the docs. Is it also containing a GUI? Um, no, but we will make one of those in about 20 minutes, so hang on. Does the model object need to be loaded in the same environment and package versions? That is probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that is probably a good idea. I don't think scikit-learn will make like breaking changes to like the way a fitted random forest is, but it's not worth taking that risk. So um, I would say, yes, that is a good idea. Okay, so there's some stuff here about directory structure. I'm just gonna skip. This is taken directly from Tom's tutorial. Let's just say that I have a folder, some folders here with some junk in them. I don't even know, Tom set this all up. So yeah, I copied some files from Tom. That's really what I'm trying to say here. And I put them in the repo. So if you clone the repo, you will have them. Um, so let's just move past that. Okay, so now we're gonna actually deploy this thing. Um, and so there's two things we're gonna look at. An API uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second, and a web application with an actual user interface. And so um, basically I'm gonna show you four things now. I'm gonna show you the API version, um, and I'll say what that is in a second. I'm gonna show you that on my own laptop and then on a server somewhere, and then I'm gonna show you the web application ver version with the user interface on my own laptop and then on a server. So we're gonna do these four boxes in this table in the next 20 minutes or so. And so um, let me go to here. So um, you're gonna be approaching this from different starting points. Like some of you have taken CPSC 310, for example, uh, many of you haven't. But for our purposes, if you've never heard of an API, it's something that exists at a particular web address and it can accept information and return information. And that's basically um, all that really matters for today. Um, and so again, copied from Tom's tutorial, there's this file app.py in here. Okay, so this is some Python file um, that Tom wrote that has this return prediction function that we just talked about. It loads the saved model file. So we talked about saving the, the, the joblib.dump. We just did that to save it. So this Python file loads up the model file and then it waits around for someone to try to do something to it. And then it calls this return prediction function. And that, that's basically what it does. So uh, we're not gonna go into any kind of details about this, but this is all using this tool called Flask. And if you're interested in learning more, um, Tom recommends these resources that I've put here. If you wanna learn more about Flask, I don't really know anything about it. Um, but what I do know is that if I open a terminal, so I'm in the web API directory, of where my repo is. I have fired up the environment, um, the course environment, and I'm going to do python app.py. 
and it's going to do some. Oh no! This is exactly what you just asked about. Did I not make the thing in this environment? Oh, that is so weird. Live demos always go. That's, that's so funny. Uh, but I thought I I thought I used the course environment to make the file. Um, and I'm in the environment. Okay, let me control C this. That's so silly. Let me check my own terminal for a minute. Hold on a second. Do I not have the course environment? Bizarre. I mean, it's fine. I think it's still going to work, but oh, I didn't run. Okay, let me run this. Um, let me run this and try it again because I didn't actually run this cell. Okay, no warning this time. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I figured like my Jupyter is running in the course environment and my terminal has the course environment activated so they should really have the same version of scikit-learn. Um, and but somehow I had some old file, uh, some old pickle file thing that you small. Okay, but that's a, an awesome illustration of your question. You should probably be using the same version. Um, by the way, pickle is just Python's term. It's kind of a, a, a clever term of, of you know, pickling to like preserve something as what they call it in Python, then unpickles to get it back in again. Okay, uh, so that's, that's, why they, that's why they call it pickling. Um, Okay, I'm just looking at the chat. How many displays, including your laptop, do you have in your workstation? Private message. I have. I just have one big display that I'm using. Um, a salty cucumber. Okay, let's continue. So now that that is running, scroll, 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 scroll. Um, I should be able to send a request to this API, and it works. So I told it. Oh, and, and I can actually go to this URL in my browser. I can open a new tab and it is alive and it is showing me this thing, which is exactly what we had in app.py that it was supposed to show us. So uh, again, some of you will not have seen curl before, but suffice it to say, I am sending a message. The message contains this information, which is the features, length 0.41, et cetera. And I'm telling it is a JSON, which is a type of file. And I'm saying go to this address and it's going to this address, which is my local machine. Um, I wonder if this would work too. Yeah, okay, so it's my local machine, some port, and then it's calling predict and then it calls this function, which is predict and it's doing all the things. So, so that's cool, but not that useful because you all can't do this because it's just running on my local machine and if i actually want to use this i don't want my server <laughs> i don't want my server to be my laptop i don't want it to be that if i turn off my laptop my whole machine learning thing doesn't work anymore that, that'd be silly uh, are you going to ask us to do this on the final no definitely not so um i specifically put this as the learning objectives for today to just signal to you all kind of what i'm expecting you to get out of this um okay so yeah and, and again i'm i'm very aware that you are coming from different backgrounds into this course okay but but i think it can make sense that i don't really want my laptop to be the thing that is receiving these requests of the features and sending back to someone the prediction because if i go to sleep and turn off my laptop and my web app on the app store stops working everyone's going to be upset and if the machine learning stops working. So that seems reasonable. And so I want it on some actual server out there. And um, I guess I could have my own server, but I don't really want my own server. And most people don't run their own servers. So um, we can use a tool called Heroku that's going to do that for us. So we're going to move from the upper left thing here to the upper right thing here. We're going to deploy this on a server. Um, and so Heroku is something you can, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a company, I guess, and they offer a service and I've signed up for it and they have some free amount of stuff. So I haven't paid for it for this demo. 
Uh, but I went on there, created an app. Um, again, you can follow the steps if you want. Um, I did a bunch of stuff, but long story short, um, yeah, okay. Log me in, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hopefully that's not like some super important secret key. Okay, so log me in. Um, so there's some steps you can follow here that basically you make a Git repo and you push it to Heroku and that's how it deploys your app. Um, but I've already done all of that, so I'm not gonna do it again. But had I done it, um, it would have actually deployed to, let me make this a bit more readable. It would have actually deployed to, so before it was localhost, um, which means my own laptop, but now it's an actual place, herokuapp.com. And so if I run it now, it's sending this information to some Heroku server, I don't know where it is in the US or whatever, that has, un, that has opened up my little random forest and is just waiting around and then it got these features and then it sent me back to my computer this prediction. So for any of you following along, if you run this cell, uh, you should be able to get a prediction as well. And you should be able to change the features and get different predictions as well. So, um, and, and I should have said before, but I forgot. In Jupyter Notebook, if you put an exclamation mark, it runs that thing as like a shell command. But you could also open up your shell, like your actual terminal, and then do the same thing uh, but without the exclamation mark, and it should work as well. So can anyone actually query this from your computer? If you just have open up a terminal and you run this um, in, your, in, in your terminal, it should work. Okay, yeah, it works for someone, so that's awesome. Okay, so you are running my random forest. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's, that's already useful, right? Like now you could make a whatever thing you wanna make that needs to use machine learning and whenever it needs to make a prediction, it can hit this API um, and it can use your model. So we have already deployed the model, um, which is great. Any questions about that? Can the models be trained on Heroku too? Um, I have no idea. I don't know much about Heroku. I would guess, no, that's not really the point of it. Um, but for example, Amazon, like AWS has something called SageMaker. Um, and Tom actually has another tutorial on that if you want to check it out. And there it has like the whole package, like you'll do the training and the deployment and everything. Okay. So let's keep going. So now I want to do the web app thing and I'm kind of regretting like maybe I should have done these in the opposite order or just skip the API because I know some of you uh, don't have experience with APIs. So if that was confusing, I think this one might be a little more relatable actually. And so I'm going to use the same tool Flask, but I'm going to make an actual web application. So going back to this directory, I had web API, but I also had web application and you'll see Tom had some stuff in here like some HTML, um, okay, some HTML files and some CSS and whatnot. So he put together a little web page. Um, and so we can do the same thing. So I have another term. I should have said, by the way, uh, you can have terminal sessions in Jupyter Lab. So if you press a little plus here and you go to terminal, um, then you get a terminal. And so when I was saying like you can run this in a terminal as opposed to in a Python notebook, um, bah, probably need to get rid of those. Sorry. Probably the problem. Uh, 
Yeah, what did I do? Oh, well, I'm not going to deal with this right now. Did I miss something up there? Okay, good. Yeah, now it worked. Um, good. So, it, uh, yeah. I'm not even in the course environment here or anything. This is just a plain old terminal and I'm running this command um, and it works. So, so going to the web app thing now, um, I have I had this terminal open in the web application directory, which is again in the repo. So if you clone the course repo, you will have this directory as well. And it also has its own app.py that's very similar to the other one, but it's for the web application. I can fire this one up. No error this time. That's a relief. Okay, so this is a web application as opposed to only the API. So this one actually has an interface. Um, yay! And it makes a prediction. So um, that's cool, right? Like. That that that's maybe more more relatable than the than the API thing that I showed you. It's a little HTML form, and you type in the features, and it gives you the prediction. That's cool. Uh, but again, this is still on my laptop, so if you go to this address, it's not going to do anything because it's just running locally on my machine. Which brings us to the last box in our little table, which is let's do the web app on Heroku so that all of you can access it. So again, there's some commands that I've already done. If I control C out of this, get myself into Heroku, authenticate. Um, so now, if you all go here, if you all go here, then you should be able to access this prediction prediction thingy. Is it working for people? Awesome. So that's not hosted on my laptop anymore. It's hosted on some Heroku server in some heavily air conditioned data center somewhere, probably in the US. Um, yeah, what you, someone mentioned about the 14.4 years. So remember, it's a random forest regressor. And the random forests are not like linear models. With the random forest, if the biggest y value in the training set was 14.4 years, it'll never predict anything bigger than that. So what's happening here, I think, is that I'm inputting unreasonably large values for the x's. Um, and so if I make a smaller hard to pronounce C creature, then I will get a different prediction. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's nice because, I mean, there's the steps here. They're not too hard to follow. You can get a free account on Heroku or you can, if you want to scale it up, you can sign on with them or someone. And that's pretty much it. So the goal here was to basically say, well, actually, I'll get to the discussion in a second, but first, first, any questions about this? Yeah, so you could pick your own data set of choice and train it and save it and follow all these steps and deploy it and have your friend, you know, use it or whatever. It's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so discussion. Um, yeah, so there's many ways to deploy a mod. I mean, the HTML form is not actually that useful if you're like integrating this into some larger app. Um, the API one is a lot more useful. Like if you have a, I don't know, like if you have a face recognition prediction thing and then your camera app on the iPhone wants to like find faces, it could call that API or something it's not gonna like type things into an HTML form. So the API is kind of the more like machine to machine connection and the HTML form was more of like, okay, a human typing things in, but you wouldn't, even if you had like a hundred features, you wouldn't wanna type in all those hundred features really into a form. Um, but you could have something, for example, you could make like a website where it's like upload an image and then you click upload and it'll be like, I predict this is an image of a, 
you know, baking soda or something. So, so that, that could be useful. Um, so yeah, a, a deployment that we did was pretty straightforward, but it could get a lot more complicated. Like what if there's privacy or security issues? Like often your data set is secret in a lot of cases. And, and so you got to think about that. Like, can someone try to reverse engineer what might've been in your data if they can access your prediction and do you want random people accessing your prediction or was your API only for internal use by your own app? What if 10,000 people are asking for a prediction at the same time? Can you handle it? What if someone puts in some crazy feature like negative shell length, you know, what's going to happen there? Um, all that, what if they, yeah, what if they make a typo? What if this, what if that? What if it needs to be in real time? Like what if prediction needs to be really fast or you're in an edge computing environment? Like what if this needs to, well, okay. If you have internet access and you can send the features, that's one thing and you can just use an API. But so for example, with like a, a iPhone and you have Siri and you talk like it sends your voice somewhere and then it sends back the text or at least it last time I checked a few years ago that's what it was but sometimes you actually want to do the computing on the device itself like no this needs to stay on the phone or like a security camera is a really common example you have a security camera it's like really low like power usage or you have a drone that has a battery you can't use a lot of electricity you can't send the image from the drone to like some server to do the api so for whatever reason the computing the predict has to happen on the drone or on the security camera that can make deployment way more complicated so there's a lot of issues to think about um just look in the chat you could give minus weight Okay, yeah, I mean, in this case, it'll be fine. Um, what are some of the most commonly used methods to deploy models in industry? I think Amazon SageMaker is pretty popular, but um, I'm not too sure what most people are doing, to be honest. Any other questions? On a side note, the iPhone 12 has a neural network in it. Ugh. Yeah, we'll probably start seeing more like customized chips on devices and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, if Siri doesn't already work with your internet turned off, it probably will in the next year or two. Maybe not completely related, but is there an RStudio alternative for Python and scikit-learn like environment that allows me to both see and interact with the data? Um, yeah, a few comments about that. So people seem to really like PyCharm and VS Code. And I think you can set them up to be more RStudio-like, even if they're not. Um, it seems like RStudio itself, the company, is like moving into the Python space a little bit as well. So you can now like do quite a bit of Python development in RStudio, despite the name. Um, but yes, I do agree Jupyter is not like the way to go for a bigger project. Um, and so I would, yeah, I would recommend checking out our studio or BS code or PyCharm or stuff like that. Um, just looking to check. Yeah, Spider. Yeah, Spider is another one. I don't know. I wasn't too impressed by it, but it is kind of a clone of our studio. So that's true. It really looks like our studio. Uh, if you followed the course, install instructions with Anaconda, you already have Spider. Yeah. Takes forever to load. Yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but okay. Um, okay, uh, we're back for the last part. So I just wanted to kind of reflect on the course for this last segment. So when I proposed this course, I don't know when it was, a year or two ago, um, I had these learning objectives. So identify problems that may be addressed with ML, select tools, transform data, apply tools, describe, train, and test, communicate results, be realistic about the limitations, create reproducible workflows and pipelines. So just reflecting on that, um, I think we did most of those except for this one. 
which will probably become its own course. So I mentioned a few times that we're trying to create a minor in data science that have a bunch of new courses like a visualization for data science, databases for data science, and like a data science workflows type course. Um, yeah, we, we did pipelines, but we didn't do like the whole reproducibility, Docker, all that kind of stuff. Um, although we did just talk about how my scikit-learn version weirdly changed. Um, so, hey, we did something. Um, yeah, so I think we'd add, to add a couple onto these about what we did, um, we talked about the scenario where you accidentally mix training and test data, um, which we've been calling the golden rule. I should just say that Mark Schmidt came up with the term golden rule when he made 340, and then we've been using it in these UBC courses, but uh, a random person you talk to might not know what you're talking about if you say the golden rule, or hey, maybe it's going to catch on and the whole world will call it that soon, but a heads up on that. Um, and then, yeah, I think another thing we did is we worked on good habits, uh, like starting with dummy classifier and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of my thoughts. Um, and I, I see the course as kind of having three parts to it. The kind of core supervised learning on tabular data, which is a very common use case of machine learning and the one we really focused on the most. And so you're, you're splitting, you're pre-processing, your pipelines, your golden rule, the metrics, um, transforming targets, feature importances, hyperparameter optimizations. So that's kind of like the core, um, what, should I do in the standard situation kind of part of the course? Um, and maybe before I go on, any questions or comments? Okay, and then there was the second part of the course where we were like, let's talk about some special cases that tend to show up. Uh, like what if you have images or you have text uh, we talked about these idea of embeddings and and that was a theme that I didn't really make clear as a theme and I'd like to think about how to play that out more but like we used a pre-trained feature extractor to turn images into feature vectors and we used the pre-trained neural network to turn text into feature vectors and I, um, I feel like there's still some work to be done kind of unifying that. Um, we talked about ratings and sparse matrices and all that stuff. And then we talked about time. So we had the time series lecture and then the survival analysis lecture. Um, is part one considered doing a full analysis on a data set? Yeah, more or less. I'll get, I'll actually get to that in a second though, specifically. So just hang on. And then there were just some other stuff that was in the course here and there, ensembles, outliers, clustering, bunch of different models that we talked about, some more, some less, um, and then the communication and skepticism and ethics pieces. So that's kind of my view on what we covered. Any questions? Okay, um, so to get to the question then, um, that's what we covered, but like, what do I want you to do having taken this course? So some key like gotchas or things that I want you to watch out for having taken the course, um, like some rules of thumb, I guess. Do the train test split right away. Um, it's just kind of cleaner and better and, um, and only once. This is kind of a golden rule thing, but if you keep redoing a random chain test split a bunch of times, then the test data isn't really unseen anymore because it used to be the training data. Um, and so start with that and just put away your test data. That's one of the kind of things. Don't look at it. Don't call fit on test data. That's easy. Don't call fit on validation data. That became this very nuanced thing with, well, what about cross validation? And actually I'm calling fit on my standard scalar and golden rule and all that kind of stuff. So um, that part got kind of complicated with cross validation. 
And using pipelines is a good idea and using baselines is a good idea. By baseline, I mean like start with dummy regressor or dummy classifier and that kind of thing. Which leads me then to um, this recipe that I just kind of developed over the last few days as I was reflecting on what we did. Um, and so, to, to, and which directly addresses the question in the chat, like what do I consider doing a full analysis? So um, if you have the standard situation, which is supervised learning on tabular data, so you got your rows, your columns, like we're used to, some Y that you're trying to predict. Um, here's my kind of take home recipe. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's many steps, uh, but we can go through it slowly. So number one, have the long conversations with the stakeholders who will be using your pipeline. So make sure you know what people want before you build it. That's, I guess, generally a good idea, no matter what you're doing. Um, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is you're probably not going to be working in isolation and you probably won't be as effective if you think about yourself as this isolated machine learning person. Um, have a long conversation with the person who collected the data. The reason I put that in there is we kind of didn't focus too much on this in the course, but things like missing data. Well, you should really try to understand if you're working on a real problem, like why is the data missing? Was it corrupted? Was it human error? Um, and that's going to inform what you do about it. Like, do you need to delete things? Would it be a big mistake if you deleted things? Um, how might you impute or, or all that kind of stuff? And I'd, like, again, talk, the person who collected the data, like you have a lot of class imbalance. Okay, why do I have a lot of class imbalance? Is it because you collected the data in a way that certain classes was more likely to generate data or did it have nothing to do with that? So that's one thing we didn't really do in this course. And even just now as I'm talking, what I should maybe do next time is every time I introduce a new data set of the week or whatever it is, at the bare minimum, maybe I should at least navigate to the web page, like the Kaggle page or whatever, and say, let's try to dig into this to the extent we can that someone just posted the data set online. Like we're not going to email that person in the middle of class or anything, but just to kind of get into the habit of not thinking about the data as just given to you from somewhere, but it is kind of your business to know where it came from. Number three, think about the ethical implications. Are you sure you want to do this project? Uh, if so, should ethics guide your approach? So I actually put that in after Sina's presentation on uh, Tuesday. And I think it's worth thinking about. I mean, you might not have a choice. You might have to do the project or else lose your job. But, um, well, I mean, that is still a choice. But it might be complicated. But uh, it might be simple sometimes in that, you know, you have no stake in it and um, do, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, and then, okay, so that's kind of getting yourself ready to go. And then you go. So random train test split with fixed random seed. So the reason I'm recommending the fixed random seed is like I said before, otherwise every time you run your code, it'll do a different train test split and the test data after a while won't really be unseen anymore. And if you want to just be clean about that, you can use a fixed random seed. Or you can just have, the alternative to that is just have separate files like train.csv and test.csv. And then you'll just work with train.csv for the rest of the time or something like that. And then leave the test data alone. So, and now we're kind of getting into following like the homework eight steps that I asked you to do. Look at the data, the training data, look for outliers, think about a scoring metric. And so we talked about this a little bit, but my kind of take home message is higher values should make you and your stakeholders happier. So um, if you're doing a fraud detection and we talked about how maybe accuracy was not that good of a metric, well, it wasn't hard to think of a situation where the accuracy went up but it was actually a lot worse because it was missing a lot of frauds. Like predicting not fraud every time might have given you a better accuracy than what we were doing, but it will not make us happier. And so accuracy was not a good metric for us to be using. So 
I think you should think carefully about your metric. Um, and then we can start with the baseline. Any questions before I keep going? Okay, so create a pre-processing pipeline, feature engineering, all that kind of stuff. This is probably one of the most time consuming steps. Um, try a linear model. And um, so one thing I wasn't too careful in the course that I also want to be a bit more careful about is really if you're comparing two models and deciding which one's better, you should tune the hyperparameters of both of them so it's a fair comparison. Because if logistic regression is better than light GBM with horrible hyperparameters, that doesn't mean it'll be better with good hyperparameters. And at the end of the day, you're going to get good hyperparameters. So ideally, you'd like to kind of have reasonable hyperparameters for the things you're comparing rather than pick your favorite and then tune the hyperparameters. That being said, you might be limited by computation. Like if that's going to be too slow, you might not be able to do that. For each model, look at the subscores from the folds of cross-validation to get a sense of the error bars on the score. That's something we've been doing. Pick a model that you like. And so this goes to this giant thread that I had have pinned on Piazza. Oh, I'm not going to go to it now. Um, but like, how do you actually choose a model? And the best cross-validation score is a reasonable way to choose a model, but you might decide to deviate from that and say, well, this one has a little worse cross-validation score, but it's a much simpler model. It's overfitting a lot less. I feel more comfortable with this. And that's totally legit. Um, just look in the chat. What is the best way to detect outliers? So what we talked about was, um, like visual inspection and uh, we looked at those isolation forests since I could learn. You could also try some sort of clustering and like DB scan and see what's not in a cluster or something. Um, yeah, you could compute all kinds of statistics, but, but I don't know. It's um, try a whole bunch of approaches and, and see what comes up. What's the golden rule called outside of UBCCS? Leakage. Yeah, it might be called leakage. Um, but I'm not sure there's like a official name. Um, yeah, but I, like I, I think if, if you said like leaking information from the test set to the training set or something, people would understand. Uh, Quantel scalar is the best approach, approach to deal with outliers. So, if you want to find outliers and remove them, you can do that. If you find them and you want to leave them in, but use methods that are not going to be messed up by outliers, that's a different story. And you can do something like, I mean, there's that robust scalar too in scikit-learn. The quantal scalar is maybe a bit extreme. Um, and there, there were things like Huber regressor that we talked about in terms of outlier. So the Huber regressor thing was for outliers in the Y values and the quantile scalar, robust scalar thing was for outliers in the X. So it's important to ask yourself, are these outliers in X or outliers in Y? And I totally agree with the comment in the chat. Outliers is related to domain knowledge and, and subject expertise. And it is somewhat hard to talk generally about it. But yes, do keep in mind this question of are the outliers in my features or in my regression targets? Because I think that's an important distinction. Okay, let's keep going. Um, look at feature importances. I think you're kind of in the habit of doing that. Are there some other diagnostics I should be doing, like for classification of confusion matrix, for regression, those scatter plots? Just the more you can dig into things and sanity check things, I think the better. Um, try to calibrate uncertainty. That's actually not something we talked about in the course, so I won't really say much about it. Um, but basically, trying to align things like predict PRABA scores with like reasonable measures of confidence. Um, and maybe I should think about adding that into the course if I can make room, but we didn't really talk about it and it's not that easy. Is there any similar to anything similar to confusion matrix besides the scatter plots? Um, well, those scatter plots are kind of like a confusion matrix if you think about it. Like if you think about regression as like classification with millions of categories, I mean, a confusion matrix has like predicted over here, true over here, or whatever, true over here, predicted over here, and it has like the boxes. And that scatter plot is basically the confusion matrix, has the true things on one axis, the predicted things on the other axis, but there's like infinitely many little boxes. 
Uh, and yeah, you can make a heat map as someone suggested instead of a scatter plot, but they're actually pretty similar ideas in that you're like, what is the true value? What is the prediction? Okay, then we have our test set and then question everything again. So do my results make sense? Is there anything weird about them? Are my error bars big? Is, is, am I overfitting a lot? And then I added this in, I was quite fascinated by what Sino was saying on Tuesday of like, ethics is not just something you think about before you start, but actually when you're done, there might be quantitative assessments you can do of ethics. Like he was talking about take two different racial groups and say like, does one have more false positives than the other and that kind of thing. I thought that was super interesting. So I added that in here as well. Discuss your results with the people who are going to be using this. Um, and then before deployment, you could potentially retrain on all your data. That's what we talked about earlier today. Deploy, integrate with whatever products this is for, some app or whatever, and then maybe profit at the end. And yeah, this is like an approximate list of things. And you might need to go back to something earlier on, but that's kind of my best attempt at here's what you should do. Any questions about this? What would I do differently? Yeah, I mean, this is a much shorter list than it was last time, which was the first time. I'm, I'm happier with the course now. Um, there were some things that could be reordered. I would have a multi-class classification data set earlier on. I think that could easily fit in and would be nice. And right now, multi-class is kind of randomly put at the beginning of the computer vision lecture, which is a little weird. So there's some reorganizing that could be done. And, and I'd, I'd really like to have more time for time series. I felt that was super rushed. But yeah, if you have other suggestions, you can let me know, email me. I have a, like an anonymous form on my website or you can put them in the course evaluations if you haven't submitted it yet. Uh, 3.30 versus 3.40. So yeah, um, I did the survey. I'm like trying to figure out the relationship between the courses. But 3.40 will teach you things like implementing dot fit from scratch or like what exactly is this hyperparameter mathematically? How fast is this algorithm going to run? And, in terms of the number of rows and columns in my data set and a bunch more stuff as well. So it's more like, how does it work? And this course is more like, how do I use it? Questions? How much coding versus math? Yeah, so 340 has a lot more math in this course and significantly more, it has more coding, but the coding is more like raw Python, NumPy, and the coding in this class is more like fiddling with scikit-learn and pandas. So it's kind of a different coding. Okay. Um, this is just kind of a random tradition that sometimes on the last day of class, I give people some unsolicited advice, but I didn't, I, I think at the moment, all I could really think of is like, we all need to get through the next few months. And so all I really am going to say is, um, let's take care of ourselves and take care of each other and just try to get through this crazy pandemic that we're all experiencing. Um, and if you want my, my recorded lectures from 340 are on YouTube. And if you go to the last lecture of the course, you can see my advice from my past self a few years ago, but not much to add today um, on that front. Just looking at the chat. Is the workload of 340 a lot more? Um, yes, I would say the workload of 340 is a lot more than this course. Uh, I took the class for one whole week and then dropped it after the first time. Is your advice the same? It's pretty similar. Yeah. Maybe a little different, but pretty similar. What is your opinion on Julia versus Python? Well, just way more people use Python. So my, my whole thought on programming languages is like some languages are maybe inherently more beautiful and awesome and well thought out than others. And maybe, but like, to me, what I really care about is how many people use that programming language. Cause sure I can get around the idiosyncrasies of 
Python and they'll annoy me sometimes, but like I can look anything up and there's just a bajillion documentation and Stack Overflow posts and like that's what makes it usable for me and the libraries like pandas, scikit-learn, documentation for those, Stack Overflow for those, like that ecosystem is to me what matters more than the language itself. But I'm sure there's going to be people who will super disagree with that. Um, can we expect the difficulty of the final to be similar to the homework? So to take a look at last year's final for that, uh, what would be suitable for someone who wants to continue with applied machine learning and not learn how things work? I would say maybe try doing some projects at this point, like do, do a Kaggle competition, do some projects on your own. I think you're ready after this course to kind of learn by doing. So I would, that would probably be my recommendation, I would say. Okay, so that's basically it and we're pretty much out of time. So that's it, uh, you made it, hang in there. I believe in you, we're almost there. Thank you for entrusting me with your education about applied machine learning and that's it, all the best. And uh, I will see you later. <laughs>